We left off last time in the middle of Romans 8, and so I'm going to pick up right there. We were talking about the Spirit inside of us uh, confirming that we're children of God by Him crying out within us. We had this cry of Abba, Father. And uh, so he goes on that we're children of God by the Spirit Himself bearing witness in our spirit. Verse 17, it says, And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, in order that we may also be glorified with Him. So he's talking about the suffering with him, uh, and then glorified with Christ. We do go through uh, situations in this life that, that are going to be somewhat uh, discomfort, discomforting. And uh, he calls them sufferings. And, but he talks about the sufferings, that, though, in verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So we've got to have something in mind. We've got to have the picture in mind. And and Paul does develop this through the, through the book of Romans, that there's, there's something to look forward to. There is a redemption that's coming that's fuller than what we've experienced at this point. Jesus has paid for it all, but it's coming to us. Uh, it, you, one, we, we first receive the grace of God and our forgiveness of sins and that redemption that we have by faith. And then fully it's, it's uh, brought out later as we uh, actually get a new body. And so he goes on to talk about that at this point. And verse 19, it says, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. What is that talking about? The revealing of the sons of God. Well, I think it's really talking about we come into our fullness. When Jesus died, he died to redeem us from our sin, the consequences of sin, and the power of sin. But he also uh, died to redeem all of creation and bring us back. We see we had the Garden of Eden picture in Genesis 1. The tree of life is in the middle of the Garden of Eden in Genesis, I guess, 2 or 3, whatever. And then we, we see at the end, in, in the book of Revelation, the tree of life appears again in the middle of the paradise of God. And so we see a, a, just a, re, a redeemed creation, everything. It's gone from what it was in the beginning, a very beautiful, wonderful place, and it's redeemed to that in the end. And so there's a, there's a redemption of all of creation, and it says, and the anxious longing of creation is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God, the manifestation where we come into our fullness, and that's going to be the end result of his redemption, of his cross, of all that he did for us. It's going to be manifested when we, we come into our fullness and we are totally redeemed creatures again. For the creation, verse 20, was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So creation is under this, this mandate or this curse of corruption, but it's going to be freed from that when mankind comes into its fullness and we are revealed for who God uh, really uh, redeemed us to be. Uh, it says, verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. I don't know if you stop and listen to a tree or a rock or something, you know, and maybe they're, you hear them groaning. But I don't know that that's exactly it, but there's this longing that even the creation is waiting for. Uh, it's, it's like a childbirth. It's like coming into something new. It's, a, it's about to come, and all of creation's waiting. And in verse 23, it says, And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. So this adoption or this revealing or this manifestation of the sons of God is the redemption of our body. This body that he was just talking about, the law of sin, dwells in this, this, this thing that's, that's in us. He said there's coming a time when our bodies are going to be redeemed completely. We'll have a new body in this, this, this thing that we're battling of this tendency to sin, this law of sin that's in it will be finally over with. And it says, even we ourselves, once you have a, uh, the first fruits of the Spirit, you have a down payment of the Holy Spirit, within ourselves, we're like, ah, yeah, I, wish, I wish I wasn't like that. I wish I didn't have those desires. I wish I wasn't battling that. And he said, one day that's going to be over. And it's going to be that day when we have the redemption of our body. And he goes on to talk then about uh, the, the work of the Spirit in us. And so the next section here in, in Romans chapter 8, it talks about how the Spirit helps us even intercede. He talk, once again, there's groanings come up here. 
Groaning's too deep for words, he says in verse 26. We don't always know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit helps us to pray. He intercedes according, uh, for the saints according to the will of God. And then he says, we know that all things work together for good, in verse 28, for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Because the Spirit is working, and, and even the Spirit is helping us pray and intercede for those things so that everything is going to work out to God's glory in, in this uh, process. There's some things that are also spoken about here that are so important for us to understand. Uh, I think in, uh, in, in verse 29 it says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And it says, here's the, here's the, the goal. He, for whom he foreknew. It's interesting that he, he, he re, re, refers to the... Uh, the nation of Israel is the ones he foreknew a little later. Uh, interesting here, there's provision that's been made for everybody to be uh, saved, revealed as a manifest son of God, to get this inheritance. And, but the goal of, of God in all of this, all the sufferings that he talks about here, the way the Spirit is helping us through groanings and intercession, he says the goal is he predestined us to become conformed to the image of his son what God's working in us he wants us to be conformed to the image of his son we're more concerned with our convenience our comfort our wealth our you know that things go well with us and our prominence and whatever he's more concerned about our being conformed into his image so that every circumstance that's in this life can be used to do that every circumstance can be used to conform us to the image of Christ if we let that if we let the circumstance and situation have its work uh, accomplished in us. We, if we get through it with the right attitude, if we let the Spirit help us in our intercessions, and that uh, he's, he's going to bring us to that point where we'll be conformed into his image. In verse 32, then, it goes on, and it's, it's talking about the power of the Spirit still working in us. He who did not spare his own Son but delivered him up for, for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? So God has given us in his son all good things freely given us all good things so so far up to this point in chapter 8 what we see here is that he saves those who have faith both Jew and Gentile and then he makes provision in that the redemption is not only uh, that we're freed from our sin and going to heaven but he's going to redeem the whole earth all creation is groaning waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God and then he tells us that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, which he then explains that those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He's justified him, glorified him. And this is all building to a place where he's, he's giving us the assurance that God is really with us. The Holy Spirit is there to help us in our prayers. And, uh, and, and so all of this is building to a point which comes to the end of chapter 8, he says, uh, verse 33, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. So what we're looking at here in the remainder of this is we need to have this firm assurance of all the things that he's done for us. So when we get to these hard times, we understand that he's not left us. I imagine Paul could have had some doubts at times when he was being stoned or um, beaten with rods or left for dead that, you know, where is God in this matter? But so he he ends the, the eighth chapter with these words. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for thy sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Look, he's talking about times really bad. I mean, to, to, to liken it to uh, we're being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And, and you know, but he's saying... Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The question is, is not looking for an answer. It's saying no one shall separate us. So he goes on in verse 37. It says, Been all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he summarizes the end of 8 with this this, this exhortation to us to remember that 
uh, we're not going to be separated from the love of Christ. No matter what's happening in your life, no matter the kind of sufferings you go through, the persecutions, the accusations, whatever, if you feel like you're not going to make it, he's made provision for you to go all the way to being glorified. And so we can trust him, in the, especially in the midst of uh, the times of tribulation and persecution, even if you're being put to death, as he put here, all day long.